Yeah, so the second part is going to be about um, further aspects about data, data publishing. So um, the first thing I want to talk about in this section would be how to actually publish the data. Uh, we're going to have a short uh, practice, which I'll probably skip this time because of the time. Um, after that, we have, um, I want to talk about the data structures and uh, how data collection can contribute to publishing better data. Then one section will be about data curation and a very important aspect of um, high quality data. I have two practice sessions about how to detect issues together uh, of data tables and then also how we can fix them in a data curation practice in Jupyter Notebook. Um, then we uh, I show you how to submit data in case uh, you haven't submitted data yet. Uh, some of you have already, uh, but in case you don't, then you just see how a typical data submission process uh, is going to look like. And at the end, how to properly cite your data publication. And at the end, again, our questions and answers. So um, how to publish data? I came up with a workflow, which I think um, is not a bad, uh, not a bad way to follow, uh, which really does not start with collecting data. So actually, before we publish our data, data collection is not the first thing we want to do. So the first thing we actually should think about is uh, before we start the whole process would be how, what kind of data are, you, are we going to produce? So that should be already part of your data management plan, so that you get an idea about what data you produce. Is it going to be um, tabular data? Is it videos? Um, is it going to be images? Um, all the kind of um, different data formats you can have. Then you should find out where you want to publish your data. So that's what we have done in the first section today, that you already know what repository would be suitable for your data and what the requirements are. Um, and based on that, you should define a suitable data structure for your data recording and for your collection data process. Um, and once you have collected the data, then you should look at your data and see if there are any issues which you need to curate. And once you have done that, that you're actually ready to submit your data, um, check them in the submission process and publish your data. Um, and that's not the last step. The last step would, would be then also to make sure you properly cite your data. So coming to the first point, so what of kind of data will I produce? I already mentioned that. So there are tons of different kinds of data. Um, and that should be, and you should know really what you, how your data is going to look like. Also, for instance, if you have a machine which records a certain type of data where you maybe want to publish your raw data to really know how it's going to look like. Um, and um, also in, in order to find a suitable repository for that. Again, we have lots of choices. We have done all this in the first block. So plan ahead, find the right repository, have a checklist of what things you need to know and to select the right repository. Use the repository databases, which we have checked out today in the morning um, and make sure you do not submit last minute. So um, don't do the same mistake I did with Figshare where I need my DOI and Submit just before, or like you just got the regis spec and they're positive, and then you just need a DOI. So don't do that. At the latest, um, submit your data when you submit your paper. The best would be actually you already submit your uh, submit your data once they're ready for analysis. So that's actually the best time to do that. Um, what are the requirements in terms of okay? Can I actually, as an individual, um, publish data in this repository? For instance, at GBIF, um, as written, GBIF only publishes data set directly from organizations. So individuals who wish to publish relevant data sets should work through their affiliation. Uh, so it's not that easy in some repositories to, as a single re researcher or as an individual researcher, to publish your data. So we should, to, to check that first. Um, then again, you also need to know okay, what kind of data are accepted. For instance, Pangea is more about uh, environmental data and life science data. Um, Zenodo can do pretty much anything. Um, and NCBI only sequence data. So that's something really fundamental. You should know beforehand. Um, and you should also check before you collect your data, what metadata are compulsory for the repository and which ones are optional. Um, and because sometimes when the moment you collect data, um, if, you, if you do not know that you need some certain metadata, you may just miss the opportunity to collect those data. Um, 
it could be elevation data, could be geolocation data. So you want to miss that, you would, sometimes it can be really hard to get back to that and recover those data. And then you may actually fail to match that requirement for the repository um, to, to do this. Um, but generally I would say, collect, even if there are some metadata optional, but collect as much metadata as possible. The more metadata you have, the better and more understandable is going to be your data set. Um, some repositories also have certain metadata standards. Uh, so for instance, uh, GBIF has the Darwin Core standard schema, um, which may be useful to know because then you can already label your data tables based on these uh, on this certain vocabulary, which saves you work in the later curation process. So you already have the certain, you already match to, to the certain vocabulary, um, which you can use in your, during your data collection already. Uh, some websites or some repositories like Dexis, for instance, they, they can also create templates based on the, the, their metadata schema, which can also be handy. So there are different ways to, to do this as well. Um, check the file formats. Uh, for instance, Pangea is written, we mainly accept tabbed limited text files, but we have a huge variety of formats you can accept from images, videos, and um, yeah, audio recordings. Um, also, we can link to Zenodo, like we do not publish code, but we can link to Zenodo as well. Then Dryad also has a huge variety of formats uh, they accept. Um, so there's also lots of flexibility in there. Um, one thing to consider is the file encoding. So one common problem we have at uh, data curators, for instance, is that we get the file submitted in a wrong format. Um, like for instance, Pangea accepts UTF-8 encoding. Uh, if you write your data in Excel, I think the standard is um, ASCII format um, and not UTF-8. And the problem then is that, um, especially when you have really big data sets that you have, and you have names like, in, for instance, a lot of special characters, like, don't know, check, um, check, check names, for instance, or locations in Russia, which have really um, yeah, special characters, they will not be translated properly and they come up as errors in the data set. And that's not gonna look nice. And it's also gonna make it very difficult for machine reading. Uh, so make sure you have the, the encoding that's required by the database. Then you also want to define a suitable data structure. So plan your data structure before data collection. Uh, that's going to save you a lot of time during data submission. You don't need to do so much conversion of your data format to match it to the repository because you already have the right format in place. So it assures the compliance with the repository requirements. And it also makes sure is once you have a certain parameter on your, on your worksheet, uh, on your data collection sheet, uh, that you can cover all the essential metadata at the time you record and collect your data. Um, and then also make sure, especially when you work in big collaborative groups, I know from, for instance, um, big expedition, they go to Siberia and they have groups of 10 scientists who collect different data to the same project, but they all use, they all collect, essentially collect the same data at different locations. Um, so make sure that everyone has the same data table and the standard data table. So you don't have, it saves a lot of trouble in terms of merging, merging these different versions um, and avoiding errors in the process. And the best case for this is to actually use templates. Um, and in these data templates, you should also follow certain standards. So for instance, very basic, but very often not followed is for instance that you have columns of features, rows of observations, you only have one header, with unique names, uh, unique parameters. Uh, one save, one data entry. So do not have a value and then the error at plus minus error in the same cell, have it then as a separate column. Um, so it's, uh, again, it's in terms of also uh, having an easy analysis workflow for reusers and also for machines to more easily extract those data. Um, define standard terms. So if you have a certain parameter or like certain features you want to describe, let's say you want to describe a tree, um, you want to say if it's green, blue, or whatever, so that people have ex the exact same wording, not even in terms of having blue starting capital letter and the other one writes blue with small small caps. So make sure there's a standard vocabulary for the, the things you want to describe, which is also universal in your research team. Um, so that uh, also makes it easier and, and avoids errors later on. And don't, uh, again, don't use secondary headers. Um, do not have summary statistics in, in rows, like don't have the average at the bottom of your row. Uh, this is like a just a data table. It's not an analysis table. Um, have no figures, don't have plots and colors in there. So it's all unnecessary clutter, which you don't need and just uh, 
um, yeah, it's not required. Um, and just an example to show you okay, what is what is happens if there's no standard data structure. So this is basically uh, some few data sets from, from Pixture. Um, one thing that can happen also in terms of, again, imagine you're a reuser, you want to reuse those data, maybe not today, maybe in 20 years. So then you come across this and it says, sorry, we can't pre with this file. So even the database already has an issue of reading this, this file. And even though our, our data files are not that uncommon, but who knows, is it still going to be the case in 20 years and 30 years, right? So we also need to make sure that uh, we have a standard data structure that is readable um, and best in text format, of course, um, and not commercial as well. Um, that's another example where you just have a, a printout as PDF it's more or less, um, it's basically just a supplement of a paper, um, how to machine read, um, because it's just textual data, it's not digital, it's not digital in this sense, um, has multiple headers, uh, has some other information, even has the line numbers in there. So it gets really hard to even access single values in there. Another table as an example, you can see again, you have secondary headers. Uh, we have oddly also some parameters in the column. Um, and have lots of different abbreviations, which you don't know, a unit in the in the cell. So that gets really um, difficult to to also yeah analyze. But also some tables that are actually not too bad that actually have a good order, match most of the standards. Uh, but it just shows it's just a huge variety if you don't have proper standard of data structure. That's why again, uh, data templates are a good choice. Um, you check your repository, so once you found one, they not rarely offer templates, standard templates. So it's good for you, it's also good for the repository because both sides save time. Um, so look out for those um, templates wherever you go, because um, they make sure that uh, they are, first of all, the data collection is easy and curation process and it ensures compliance with the database requirements. It's pre-formatted and it has predefined metadata in there. So you can see here already in the parameters, this are actually uh, follows um, follows a, a schema, a data schema, or like a vocabulary. And this is a template from GBIL, for instance. Yeah. Then more template examples. We in Pangea, we also have different templates depending on what data you submit. Um, and again, for uh, Vexes, you can also create, as far as I understood it, you can also create your own data templates. Um, and for instance, case of Pangea, you can just go here and you have a, we have a wiki actually. Um, and then you can see we have different templates here, which you can just download and then fill in, um, which we also highly, highly recommend if you want to submit data to Pangea. It saves you and us a lot of um, uh, back and forth proofreading and data correction and requesting metadata. So it's a good practice to use those templates. Yeah, then I come to the data collection process itself. So that's obviously very important. And um, I showed a picture here with um, a hand data recording also under harsh conditions. So I don't know who, who of you have, has gone through this process already. Um, so it's, uh, it's always not easy to record data in the field. It's a tedious process. And you can imagine that in this process, you have lots of maybe errors happening um, uh, and issues. And so we probably have, there are probably other ways to, to make it easier, I would say, and also more accurate and um, um, to enhance the publication of high quality data later on. So generally follow your data collection, follow good data collection practices to, to reduce errors and creation efforts. Um, again, use the standard templates before you go into the field for data collection. And I would recommend if possible, record digitally. So there are many methods you can record it on a on your mobile. Um, uh, for instance, there are customer there are apps you can have for data collection that are, you can customize, or you can even have the recordings direct to the cloud if possible if you have an internet connection. Avoid um, commercial proprietary for data formats um, because they are often encrypted, or that someone have to, needs to have software to open that. So that's very difficult. So make sure you have uh, open or formats that can be easily. Uh, read such as .csv or simple text files. Um, and in the field or in the lab, try to also apply version control. If you have the possibility, again, Git, the topic came up many times. So introducing Git into your data collection workflow is very 
a very good thing to do, especially if you work in big collaborative groups. Everyone has their own data table or multiple people work on one data table and then Git gets especially important to trace uh, trace back changes in, in, the, in your data table. Um, just to give some examples of how we can actually use our phones uh, to record data. So uh, just recently came across um, um, an app from our data support team at uh, the Wegener Institute, for instance, they have their own called mobile action log, which is um, custom designed for instance, for um, recording data on, on research vessels, where they have um, certain standard formats. You can set up your own table to collect data. It records geolocations and the station numbers where you sample um, with a bottom trawler, something like that. So that's quite a good thing to have. There are also open apps. I personally used um, something called Cyber Tracker app, which is a, it's very simple, but it's a very neat app um, where you can customize what parameters you want to collect. And the nice part is you can leverage on the possibility of your phone of collecting GPS location, for instance, and, and the time and these uh, other metadata, which are very handy. Um, and the nice part is you actually go through a standard process of collecting the data. You cannot forget entries um, and often you can just click instead of write. So I have extremely bad script. So if someone would need to uh, translate my data into digital format, there would be definitely errors. And I really, that's one of the reasons I really use that, use that uh, recording app. And I have a um, outdoor mobile, so it was also fine under really harsh conditions. I actually did this with a freshwater crayfish and it was super wet and cold and it, it just worked perfectly fine. Um, there are also other cool apps. I just also by the Avi Data Support Group, they have like these fancy um, voice recording data collection apps. Not sure if you heard about Smatrix. Um, just give an example here, they had a video. So let's zoom in here. 6.3, 6.3, pelagic, object three, species, Atlantic cod, 44, 83, 10, ground, object four, species, boss. Yeah, so you see like, this is also really fancy. It has a really good voice recognition capability and you can even use different versions of the species name. So you can say cod or Atlantic cod or Gavis Moroa, and it still recognizes it as cod. So there's fancy software out there, uh, which is nice. Unfortunately, it's not open source. This one has a price tag. Yeah, but maybe something you can introduce in your proposal. Why not? Um, I just think like, just look out there. There are really cool data collection tools that really improve the accuracy of your of the data collection process. Um, so let's go to the next page. Yeah, here you go. And I think I said also, like um, Juliana said, I'm a big uh, fan of open source hardware. Uh, and I think in the survey, one person at least, I think also plays with open hardware. I did that in my last project, pretty cool. It's um, basically an open source based hardware, microcomputers like a Raspberry Pi, uh, which you can use to collect different sensors, temperature sensors, a lot of different uh, types of uh, ways of recording the data. Um, almost any output you want, Excel files, CSV file, you can connect it to a relational database. You can connect it to the cloud. I've seen versions where you can mirror it di directly to a website like Grafana, where you can display your data online. Um, Web RP API, and it's pretty cool. So if you're ever interested in that, I really recommend you to get into this. It's a, it's a nice thing to, to play around with. Um, yeah, and then we would come to the, the next step, very important step. Of course, I'm a data curator, the data curation process. So uh, the time when you really want to polish up your data, uh, detect errors, um, um, work on your metadata and so on. So why should we care about curating our data? So it assures high quality of your data. It improves the handling and understanding of your data. So this makes sure that you have a higher reuse of your data sets. Um, importantly, your one-time effort saves endless hours of repeated curation by others. Yeah, um, and that's to imagine, like um, I remember from my own research, I spend hours and hours, days, maybe weeks on curating my data. Um, and just imagine you want your data set to be used by 10, maybe 20 or 100 researchers and just multiply that time you spend on curating your data. And then just figure out how much time is wasted and money, like, Scientists are pretty expensive, I think. 
So how much time is wasted there um, on valuable time and resources just to curate your data? So make sure you curate your data and submit them at the best possible quality. And one important part is there that there's no one can curate the data better than you because you created the data, you know what the issues are with this data and there's no one better than you to curate those data. Another thing is also, um, if you have a well curated data set, you, your data can emancipate from you. So they can grow up and become independent from you and leave and spread and live their own life. Um, you're not ever forever in science. I'm not in science anymore. Uh, so you may retire as well. Um, and you want your data, if they want to be reused for the next 100 years, you want that they stand on their own feet, that they can be understood. And that requires good curation, good um, recording and provision of metadata. Um, so some common issues, for instance, we see just some examples uh, as curators um, that in a data theory that we have um, table descriptions, markings, plots, statistics, empty rows, addition comments, and, and so on. We sometimes have wrong data types. Uh, so a data type which should be numeric is actually an object because of some errors in there. We may have the wrong date time format. Um, for instance, somewhere it's not very clear is, is the date referring to the local time where you collected the data, um, or is it the UTC standard format? For instance, Pangea assumes always it's UTC when you submit your data. Um, yeah, um, do we have the right formats? For instance, of our parameters, latitude, longitude, there you can write them in decimal or in degree format. Sometimes we have ambiguous ways of writing missing values that can also be confusing and non-standard. Um, often abbreviations are very cryptic. It's a big thing. If you want to understand your data, avoid abbreviations, um, especially if they're not documented anywhere. You may, your team may understand it, but people from outside may have no idea what they mean. Also that we have a lot, lots of decimal points, five decimal points, 10 decimal points, they don't make sense uh, because you have hardly any, uh, they don't reflect the accuracy of your measurement. Um, also still a common thing that we have a comma instead of a dot. So we have international standards. So we, re, uh, we have the standard dot as a decimal separator. Spelling always happens, uh, spelling mistakes and species names, for instance, um, or something like uh, white spaces um, in, in strings. Yeah, just show you some examples again, <laughs> again, fix here. Um, so we saw this table already where we saw we have, for instance, the secondary header where the units are written in. Um, we have abbreviations in there. I mean, temperature I can read, but DBO, I have no idea. Maybe CA, calcium, um, some things you may can like, you know, understand, but some also get very cryptic if you're not an expert in the field. Then here again, you have suddenly, you have the units up here. Can you see my mouse actually? You can't see? No, you can see, right? The laser you can see? Exactly, okay. So here you have the unit and then here you have another unit or you would expect it up here. So it's not even very consistent. And then suddenly you have another row of, is it parameters? Um, I don't know. Um, so it gets extremely confusing. Here again, you have then um, just a PDF screenshot. You have really weird format of the date a very casual way of writing it. Then you have here two entries in, the, in one field. Um, then in this one, you see you have colors, you have stacked tables, you have some descriptions here. So just imagine you want to read that with a script. It's going to be a nightmare uh, to, to extract those data. Right? And this is just one data table. Some more issues, so here it's getting better already. We had dryad, so you see it's more of a standard way already. We have our parameters, and uh, so that's a much better way how it can look. Um, but again, some abbreviations that are not always clear. What is Y-O-R? I have no idea what that means. Um, key here, R is another abbreviation. I was gonna know what this means, so it needs documentation again, or at the best is just to spell it out right in the data table especially when you do machine reading, right? Because then you just normally just pull the, pull the data tables and may not always want to check the documentation in the readme file. Um, yeah, and here again, um, probably too many decimals, probably not really reflecting the measurement accuracy and uh, some descriptions here, which uh, you need to, need to detect and remove once you want to analyze your data. 
Yeah, um, and here's the next Slido. Um, here I want you, I would like to know um, in the full data workflow. So from the data collection process, including the analysis and all these different steps. So data collection, um, data curation, and then data preparation and data analysis. How much time do you think is spent on cleaning your data? Yeah. So between zero to 40%. So it can take up quite a significant amount of time, some even more than 80%. It also depends on what field you are. That's also relevant, of course. Also how difficult it is to collect your data or if you work with already reused other data, that can also be an effector. But looking at this, I think we can all agree that we spend quite a significant amount of time of actually cleaning our data. Yeah. That's great to see. Okay, so the next practice will be, so the first part we had that we spot the issues, the second part will be that we fix the issues. Um, so for that, I prepared a Jupyter notebook, um, which we can open and hopefully it works. So that's basically a data curation checklist, which I came up with, um, which is pretty much a very similar thing I'm using in my daily work. Um, and which should just give you an example to have a standard curation workflow for yourself. So this is just an example in Python. It can be in R, it can be in Excel, whatever you, you prefer. We also have a GitHub uh, repository. If you go on there, you can um, you can go down to the README and then there's um, um, there are two badges which you can click. So either open on my binder or Google Colab. If you have a Gmail account, if you're currently logged in with Gmail, you can also open that same notebook in, in Google Colab. Yeah. And if this doesn't work, just uh, follow me. I'm just gonna walk through this through the script with you together, okay? So, so again, this is just an example how it can look like. So, but it's good to have a data curation workflow for yourself. So no matter what data you collect, but this is one, one essential step in your data analysis workflow. And by having this curation checklist, which you can also keep expanding the more data you create, uh, you have a standard procedure and you can make sure you don't skip and forget stuff. Um, so that's that can be quite handy. Um, so for this, you just need to install the libraries, um, just make sure the pip, the, the hash before the pip is taken away. So we can also install the pip library for the let long package. Um, and then we create our data table, which is like a standard messed up table. Uh, not as messed up as we had already before, but a lot of mistakes as well. And then we start checking, for instance, the data structure, as we already, as I already mentioned beforehand, where we have the one cell, one entry rules, and one column and so far. Um, so we have a first look at the data structure. And you can see, for instance, here we have some comments in the second row. Um, and we have also like some simulated summary statistics at the bottom row, so you want to get rid of that. Uh, so we just slice that out <clears throat> with the iLock command. And that's the first step you have. So we remove those unnecessary redundant entries. Um, and we check again, okay, what are our data types? So what data types do we actually have? Um, really, we have only objects. So we expect at least a few numeric values here. So we definitely know there is some, there's some errors with our data set. So we may want to have a look again. So we can see here already, ah, there's a comma in there. So we want to get rid of that. Um, or we have, for instance, here, there's an empty column here, which has um, no values in there. So maybe you want to get rid of that. So let's drop that. So as an easy command in Python, which drops any column which has no values in place. And once we execute that again, we can see that the last, last column is gone. Um, then we also saw we have these weird values. This may, may happen when we have some um, uh, meter, some don't know, like a sensor, which has a weird replacement for a missing value such as minus 999 or whatever, or we have another version of that. So it's very inconsistent um, way of describing missing values. So we want to get rid of that and just replace them with nothing. 
So we do that. So it's, it's okay, it's a small error, doesn't matter. And you see here, now it's empty. So we have a consistent way of missing values. Um, then we want to check for our missing values. For instance, we had some problems with the latitude. So we see we have here a comma in there, which you want to get rid of. And I wrote a small function, um, which you can fix there, cup of chat. So a small function, we can replace the comma with a dot. So we do that and check that again. And now we can see the comma has been replaced. Now we have a dot instead. Then we can also have a nice function from the pandas package in Python where we can uh, try to translate um, everything to a numeric wherever possible and apply this to the columns uh, where we think there should be numeric. So we do that um, and there you go. We can see a couple of those columns also after fixing that decimal error could be converted to float. So they are in the right data type format now. Um, another issue can be that we have some trailing white spaces or maybe some spaces between two different string entries. Um, so there are functions here as well where we can select only the object columns. So obviously you wouldn't have any spaces, um, leading and trailing spaces in those ones anymore. So only likely in these object columns. Um, so we select only those columns and try to replace the leading and, and trailing white spaces. So, and after that, we have the, the date issues. Um, as you remember, we had, uh, we have standard formats which you wanna to correspond to. And we saw earlier that we have um, a date in a separate column and the time in a separate column. And if you wanna to comply to standard date formatting, so for instance, Pangea, for Pangea, we have an ISO format, which is, looks like this. Uh, we need to get this together. So we basically merge the date and time here um, and then also convert it to the standard time format here with the strift time command. And after that, just get rid of the time column. And then that's how it looks like. So that's how we convert it now, these two different columns to the single date time format column, um, which matches the ISO format. Then furthermore, we have also the issue of um, having latitude longitude in one in one cell. So we said we want to have one cell, one entry only, but here they're two mixed up and we also don't have a decimal format, for instance, like in Pangea, we need a decimal format. Um, so first we separate um, these two entries here, latitude longitude and split them up. So we basically get now um, a separate column for latitude and a separate one for longitude. And then we, for instance, need to need to convert uh, this degree format into decimal format. And for this, we have this that long package, which I mentioned before in the library section, uh, which can translate um, the degree format into decimal format. And that's what it's going to look like. So very, very handy function. Um, and this way also have the standard format for latitude length longitude. Another issue we said are the abbreviations. So that's can be quite cryptic. Um, so we want to spell that out. Um, so we create a dictionary from the abbreviated terms and the spell out terms, and then use the replace command in Python to uh, translate that. So now we have a clearly non-abbreviated terms. It's much easier to read. Don't need to refer to readme file. Um, so good practice. Common issue as well, um, wrong species names, especially when you have very long tables, lots of different species, it's quite easy to introduce some mistakes in there. Um, we have some good um, tools actually, online tools, how to, to, to basically check our spelling. Um, so first of all, for that, we need to extract our species names. Um, so extract only the unique names, drop the duplicates. So we have three distinct species names in here. We save that in a file. Hopefully I prepared that file, probably not. Um, and then you could basically go to the platforms Worms and ITIS. I just check actually if I can save that. Where is it? Ah oh, yeah, species download. So we can download the file and uh, no, I can't see it because Zoom is before, it's blocking it up. 
Um, and then you can go to worms, for instance, um, and then select that file. Upload it. And match. And there you can find see, okay, um, it had um, some issues with reading it. So I guess here was the problem. Step probably comma separated. So copy the issue, the tie also in. Typic name. So the idea is basically that you create a, okay, it didn't work, sorry for that. The idea, is, <laughs> the idea is basically you can use worms or as well as itis to read in those data. And if it can find those scientific names, you get a list back um, with the RPI ID and TSN number. And if you have a mistake, for instance, like in Dolphinos, it would also flag that out by not being able to find it. Yeah, so that's how it's supposed to work. Try it out yourself again in the right format. So it's just an issue of having the right format in there that matches uh, worms. Um, there are also tools like TextSays, like an R, which you can use um, to also do the same process. Then you can also correct those names once you found out which is what is wrong. So now we have Delphinos, we have Dolphinos. Um, and then we can also uh, check for the header names, the right parameters. Um, I wouldn't go through this right now because it's Pangea specific. So Pangea basically have a public list of our parameters. So we can actually look up if you, if you're the ones you need actually match our database. Um, so I can download the Pangea para parameters and then see if, um, if they match with these different tools. Um, so again, I'm not gonna get into this. You can try it yourself later on. Um, there's another way uh, when for instance, if you have URLs like DOIs for if you have a meta, you have URLs of the data sets or publications. You can also check if those links actually work. Um, so with an automatic function here in Python, which just checks if it gets, uh, gets feedback from the web link. Um, and very often in Pangea, also in um, GBIF, you need sometimes event data. So you can also introduce an event column. In this case, for instance, Pangea, this number refers to a station number where it was sampled from a ship, from a research vessel. Yeah, and once you've done this, you save it as your created version, also important as the UTF-8 format. So the right encoding, um, and then it would be ready to submit the data. Yeah, so that's something you can look like. Feel free to use that template and expand it, modify it to your own needs. Uh, but that's how it can look like. Okay. Then we continue. So now I just continue with the data creation um, topic. So again, create your own checklist, an R, Python, Excel, whatever you like, what you prefer. Um, and maybe also use data validation tools. I also found recently that, for instance, Dryad has an framework use frictionless, uh, which is a Python based or can be implemented into Python. So check out that framework if you're a Python user, which can help you to detect issues as well. Now we come to the data, one of the last topics, data submission topic. So we wanna now are ready, finally ready to submit our data. Um, um, a process or the workflow for the data submission would be that um, you describe our data set. So metadata like title, authors, abstract keywords. You have seen some repositories already. So you, you, that they are often have a very similar set of, of things they ask you. So have them ready. Um, also provide linked information such as references to your own papers, to funders and so on. So also try to collect those information. Um, and then selecting a license. Some databases have a, you can't select. Once in Dryad, I think they, they force you to have the CC0 license. Um, in some other databases, you can select. And then it depends on what repository you choose, how long the process after the submission takes. Um, so you have either like fixture, you have no curation. So it's a drop and shoot database. There's basically no quality checks in there. Dryad does basic curation and Pangea does enhanced curation. So what that means, I explain later. 
just a few words to the licenses. Um, so we have the different license models. Uh, for instance, Riot has the CC0 license, uh, means there are no rights reserved, there's no copyright on it, it's a public domain. And importantly for us as well, there's no attribution required. So people can actually use a data set and they don't need to cite you. Uh, but it still means that we have to comply to good scientific practice. So even if you don't have to cite, you should cite because it's just simply good scientific practice. Uh, but you wouldn't get punished for not doing it. That's the difference. Um, but for the next one, uh, the CC BY license. So here, the license you need to cite the author, it's a, it's a compulsion. Um, and technically, you can be sued. Um, so that's, I think, the reason why Dryhead said we don't want it. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's just important to, to attribute and acknowledge the authors of, of the data set. So uh, that's why I think a CC BY license is still quite important. Um, otherwise, there are no, no real um, restrictions on its usage. Um, there's another one called share alike. This one is an interesting one because you can, once you use a data set with a um, SI share alike license um, and you use that further than your data, your data needs to have the same license or your data, new data set needs to have the same license. And that can become problematic if you then publish in a non-open access journal because that's actually not possible then because um, it's not open access. So you can't, you can't share the same license type. So that's going to get you into trouble. So watch out. If you use data sets with an SI license, SA license, or be aware when you put your own data set on this kind of license. So there's some restrictions with that. Um, in terms of curation levels, so the core trust here describes different curation levels. Um, for instance, uh, no curation would be, for instance, fixed share, basic curation where you just like you check just the basic metadata and the documentation if it's correct. Um, like Dryad and Pangea, we have enhanced curation. So we really um, um, do a more proper checks. So in addition to the basic curation, we also look at, okay, are the, are the formats matching? Uh, can we enhance the documentation anyway? Uh, can we get more metadata required? Are the, and check all these data issues which you already address in our data curation workflow. Um, yeah, and then we have, um, Again, an example how a data flow can look like or like a submission workflow can look like once you submit it. So you can submit your data here. Then in the case of Pangea, we have the editor in chief who decides if that's acceptable or not in terms of the scope and um, if there may be too many issues in the data set. If it's okay, then it gets passed on to the editors like me. Um, then we curate the data and then we ask the author to approve the data set. And then it goes into a correction process. So you basically implement any changes and updates by the author after the proof. Um, and once that is completed, we actually um, press the publish button and you get your DUI and citation. So that's how it works in a in basic or enhanced curation uh, workflow. Um, just again, showing you some mask, how the data templates can look like. So again, it's very similar across different repositories. Um, it's all about the title, authors, very basic information. Um, and uh, the original idea was actually to show you the data submission in Pangea. Should I stick off for it, Daniel? May it take five minutes? Um, if it is okay for all of you, I would suggest that we will do this practical lesson. Is that fine for you? Okay, I think that could be very important for for yeah. all here. Yeah. Okay. Please go so ahead. I, so I do this. So it's not that I ask you to submit to Pangea. It's more or less because it's very similar across different databases. So once you have done that, it's pretty much the same workflow for most of the different repositories. Yeah. So you can click on this link, download our data template. So it's basically a template that we have in Pangea. Yeah, and after that, you go to Pan the Pangea submission page. Um, there, you need to sign up as a user. Yeah, so we can have here, again, you can sign in with your, via your ORCID ID. So again, comes in very handy, or you just fill in all your details and confirm. Um, I just log in. So I have my login ready, hopefully. And then you see that we are on a Christmas break very soon. 
between this time. Um, and um, yeah, they basically just press the submit button. You also have a small tutorial if you want to watch how to submit this, you can also watch the video. Then you go to submit. You can enter those details. Um, so we can say, let's enter it by hand. So yeah, so don't forget to um, enter this particular title. And you can enter the, uh, the, the author details. You can also add multiple authors if you want. Um, in the case of Pangea, you can also paste the ORCID for each author in the website field. Um, I think you also remember, like earlier I showed, you can also click on the author later on once the data is published and you then can directly click on the ORCID ID. So that's where it comes in handy. But it also makes it for us easier um, to allocate authors. Um, so again, you may have more than just one Michael Ellerman in the database, and then it gets tricky for us to find out who's who. So having an awkward really makes sure we, we connect the right author. Then you can have enter different key, uh, keywords as already written here, diatoms, it even suggests some, some words already. Uh, so that again helps you, helps to make your data more discoverable, more findable, the more keywords you enter. Then you can enter an abstract, some uh, where you should really follow um, some guidelines. So for instance, in Pangea, we have the guideline how to write an abstract uh, in terms of what, when, where, why, and how. So, and treat this, please do not copy just the abstract of your paper, very important. So the data set has to have its own abstract and has to, again, stand on, on its own feet. So please make sure for each data table, write an own independent abstract, which is specific to this particular data table. And that applies to any repository. Here at the bottom, you can select the license. So by default, Pangea, we have the CC BY license. Um, you can also have a share like license uh, or CC0 license. So that's up to you. And then you can enter references. It's normally just fine if you enter the DOI, if it's a published reference with the DOI. Uh, I think in Dryad, they have the same thing. They don't ask you to paste the full reference. If you have, in the case of Pangea, if you have a paper just submitted, you don't have a DOI yet, you can also just paste that in here without the DOI um, and it can be updated anytime, the reference, even after the data set is already published. And then you can also enter multiple references here. So you can try that out. And then you go next. There you can enter different project names. So for instance, if you have um, an RV project, so you can already get pop-out field, pop-up fields. Um, where you can select different projects. If you have a new project, just enter the new name here. Um, if you have an audio associated project, you don't need to enter more details. It will already call these details about the project from the database. Um, otherwise, add more details, URL and an award number if you have one. And you can also add multiple projects if you want to and award numbers. And then here you would basically upload your data file. Um, so, here you can upload it. Um, it says also you have a data limit of 100 megabyte in case of Pangea um, and not more than 20 files. But if you want to upload more than that, you can just you can just get in touch with us and we can generate a, an upload link for you and where you can upload um, normally up to 10 gigabyte of data. So that's also possible. Um, then you may add some file description, which is specific to the file. For instance, that you have um, yeah, some special comments about it. Just it's more for the curators. Then you can have any comments. For instance, you can say, okay, I still have a paper which I want to publish or which I want to submit next week, still to come, um, or any further information. Or if more data sets coming up uh, in two weeks, please uh, write this in here. Um, interesting part is here, you can also set a moratorium. Um, for instance, if you say, ah, I actually want to publish my data already, but I do not want to have people to have access to my all my data, maybe just the metadata, uh, till I actually publish my paper, you can say, okay, maybe I need a, a year to publish my paper. Then you say, okay, I just set a moratorium. And that means for Pangea that the data publication can be seen as metadata content can be seen, but you wouldn't be able to see actual numbers of your data set, right? So that would be the stage. So it's protected in a way, but people already know, uh -huh, there are already data out there. They just need a while to get published. Yeah, and then you can basically, you can time it along with your 
paper being published, you can tame, you can release the data at the same time. Um, yeah, and then you just um, confirm the terms of use and you submit the, the publication. And then basically what happens is you get a ticket number and an email uh, where you then communicate via the ticket system. Yeah, and then the ticket system in Pangea looks like that, um, where you basically um, have everything, uh, can see all the metadata and then you can write comments and write to us via the ticket system and it gets, it's very convenient um, and change and upload files. So that's, that's how it basically works um, for the data submission process. Yeah. Um, in terms of time, so how long does it take to get your DOI? So in terms of fixture, of course, it's now because it has no curation. Um, in terms of basic curation, it can anything from now to soon. So it's also a rather short process. Enhanced curation just takes more time. You saw how much effort it takes to curate data. Um, and if you get a lot of submissions and can take quite a while, um, in case of Pangea, can take up to uh, even several months. So that's why we also say submit as early as possible. Also because the curation can just take a while. The return though is that you get high quality data set, which hopefully is gonna be reused many times. Yeah, and the last part is, okay, um, so when to publish the data again, I said that, so no later than manuscript submission. Some institutes even have a policy, so you may not, uh, you may need to publish actually after a certain time from after a project is finished. Um, and that you, but you may be able to make your metadata available, as I said, already before the data actually published. So not quite done. Last thing to do is cite your data properly. So once it's published, you get a DOI. Um, what you should not do is um, in your data availability statement, just write the database is available under this DOI, but actually properly cite your data set. So have it like this, like here you can see in the bottom, so that you actually have the whole citation uh, popping up in your reference list. Very important because that allows um, machine harvesting a proper finding of, of your citation to also make those citations count. So a very important thing. Um, if you have 10 data sets, cite those 10 data sets. So um, this is, there's no harm doing that. And it's actually really important to do this. Michael, there's yeah. one question in the chat. In the chat, okay. If my data is already curated, does the processing time also take several months or will it be now? Yeah, so it's a, it's a collective effort, right? So for your individual data set, it probably would not take long, probably would even take would take a day to, to publish your data, right? If you have a well curated data set. The problem is that as a whole, the scientific community, we often get um, not really well curated data sets and they basically uh, clog up our curation pipeline. And that's the main reason we take relatively long at Pangea. So even if your data set is, is very good, you still end up at the end of the queue. So that's why it may still take three months uh, to curate a data set. So yes, please uh, make sure you submit as early as possible. Whatever you learn today, multiply this knowledge and tell your colleagues to have properly curated data and the faster everything will go. Yeah, so what did we learn today? So today, hopefully you all learned why is it important to share and publish our research data. We learned where to publish the data by finding the right repository, how to prepare them, and how to submit, publish, and cite our data. Um, so for this, I just want to say thank you to you for listening today. I'm sorry for being over time. I try to get better. Uh, that's the Pangea team. Also, thank you to the Pangea team for contributing the con uh, parts of the content, the GF Bio team, and of course, NFDI for biodiversity.